Well, hi, I am Janet Gustorf. I am a civil appellate attorney in California, and I practice throughout California and the Ninth Circuit. And I've been doing this for about 18 years. So um, I understand that there's a variety of people on this um, program who uh, some are attorneys that have never handled a, an appeal. Some may have handled appeals and are looking for some strategies to improve their persuasiveness and likely success on appeal. So um, the way I am doing this is to kind of break this presentation into three parts. The first is pretty basic, going through the appellate process, um, the lifespan and different stages of an appeal. Um, and then the second part, I'm going to get into more of the strategy and uh, I'm going to talk both about briefing strategy and also how to prepare for oral argument. And then I'm going to finish by offering some um, some resources that I find are really helpful to have at my fingertips. And the first part, I'm going to start with the appellate process. And there's really five stages of an appeal. Um, there's the appeal starts with the notice of appeal that gets filed in the trial court. And it ends when the Court of Appeal, or if it moves along to the California Supreme Court, issues the remitter. So what happens is the notice of appeal is the document that transfers jurisdiction from the trial court to the Court of Appeal. And the remitter is the piece of paper that will transfer the jurisdiction back to the trial court. So that really is the, uh, the bookend of an appeal. So in the pre-briefing stage, what does that involve? Obviously the notice of appeal, which is filed, as I mentioned, in the trial court, usually where the case has been tried. The other document that gets filed in the trial court is the notice designating the appellate record. And this document, both of these are, there are judicial forms that really help streamline the process of beginning the appeal. The notice of appeal is a one page document. It really is very simple. The point is to just identify what is the order that or the judgment that is being appealed. The notice designating the appellate record, however, that is going to require a little bit more thought. Um, what is an appellate record? <laughs> it really consists of two things. It's the record of the oral proceedings below and the written record. And the written record can come in a few different forms. Um, most typically, there's what's called a clerk's transcript, which is what the, um, the notice designating the record really starts the process. You identify each of the documents that you want to include in the appeal. And there are some that have to be in there. For instance, all of the relevant briefing on whatever judgment or order um, or ruling that you are appealing has to be included and not just your version of events, but you need the complete. So the moving and opposing papers and all the supporting evidence. Um, there's also some other just sort of practical requirements that are set forth in the uh, rules of court. Um, so that's one way of creating an appellate record of the written materials. The other main one is instead of having the clerk do that, the clerk's office, instead it's an appellant's appendix, or you can do a joint appendix if you coordinate with opposing counsel. And there's a couple advantages to choosing an appellate's appendix, but there's also some disadvantages. So an appellate's appendix is essentially the same as a clerk's transcript, except that you are the one that will be putting together the complete record of written submissions. So it's really important to make sure that you follow all the rules and present it properly. And as courts have been moving to e-filing, there are a lot of new requirements when it comes to uh, bookmarking and electric uh, electronic um, file size and basically accessibility. But once you understand what all the requirements are, 
the advantage is that you don't have to actually decide up front, you know, within 10 days of filing your notice of appeal, what documents you want to include in the appeal. And oftentimes it's really hard to know when you file the notice of appeal exactly what you're going to end up appealing, what issues are going to be most relevant, um, what documents are really going to be necessary. So the appendix does not actually get filed with the court until you file your brief, which gives you usually several months um, to put it together. Uh, and it also gives you some more flexibility. But if you don't want to have to trouble yourself learning all of the rules and you want to make sure that you have a court compliant uh, record, then the clerk's transcript is a helpful thing. Um, the other main part of the record, as I mentioned, is the record of oral proceedings. And in the notice designating the appellate record, you also have to tell the court what hearing dates and um, what courtroom, uh, what was the nature of the proceedings, and whether you're including everything or whether it's just a portion of the proceeding. Um, you don't have to designate the exhibits uh, but you can include them in both the clerk's transcript and the appendix. And there's advantages to including them or not, but they are automatically part of an appellate record. And after some of the briefing, you are, uh, if you are requested by the court or if you want to have the court review these exhibits, you can transmit them directly to the court. So those are the two documents that really get the ball rolling, and they are due within uh, 10 days of each other in the trial court. Then once the case makes its way to the Court of Appeal and they designate a case number, an appellate case number, at that point, the next document that needs to get filed before any of the briefing is done is the Civil Case Information Statement. And this document is, again, another judicial form. Um, the purpose of it is to let the clerk know that you actually have an appealable order. Not every order is appealable, and not every judgment is necessarily uh, a final judgment, even though it might be labeled a judgment. Uh, and so if the appeal is premature, sometimes the clerk will send a notice saying, um, you know, show cause, is, is this actually an appealable order? If it's not, um, please present one within a certain amount of time or your case will be dismissed. But they have the discretion to hold on to it and kind of just pause and, and wait till, um, till you actually have the judgment. But um, if it doesn't look like it's going to be the kind of thing that's curable within you know, 10, 20 days, uh, then they will probably dismiss the appeal. So that's why one of the requirements when you file your civil case information statement, and this gets filed in the Court of Appeal, is to attach the judgment or the post-trial or post-judgment order that you are appealing from. Um, that's just one of those common little things that it, it says it on the form, but a lot of people forget to do that. And then it it doesn't get filed, it gets rejected for failure to do that. So just make sure you read all the instructions uh, when you're going through all the court documents and uh, the judicial forms. So finally, you can kind of wait. Once you file the civil case information statement, not a lot happens for the next bit of time. And what's happening is really whatever you have designated is going to be prepared. So if you've designated certain transcripts, they're going to go ahead and, and coordinate in the with the court reporters, the various court reporters that were part of the trial, for instance, um, there will be one clerk that is designated as sort of the, the main, um, main clerk in charge of appointing the main reporter who is going to organize all of the documents and paginate them properly and for whatever reason, this process takes oftentimes months, even, even when the transcripts have already been prepared as dailies. So um, oftentimes when, when clients are asking, you know, how can we speed up the process? One of the things that you can do in the interim is 
uh, before you designate the record, if you know for sure what you're going to want prepared, you can have the dailies converted into a certified transcript. And as long as it satisfies all of the tables, there's there's a, a host of rules governing how the reporter's transcript on appeal has to be formatted, um, including the, pen, uh, the index and the pagination has to be sequential. Um, but there are rules that the court reporters should be familiar with. So if you want to order it on your own, uh, that can be a swifter way of getting that lodged with the court and moving the case forward. Otherwise, the appeal is kind of a lengthy process. I think in, uh, in most recently, I think the, the state average is about uh, 18 to 22 months from the notice of appeal to remediator. So that can be that can be shortened somewhat, <laughs> um, both by by the briefing schedule and also especially in the record preparation. Okay, let's see, and there is a question in the chat. Okay. Um, can you? Uh, which it says which of these pre-briefing requirements are curable if you mess up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, everything but the notice of appeal. The notice of appeal is the one document in uh, in the appellate world that is unforgiving in state court. It's uh, the rules are slightly different in federal court, but we're we're gonna limit this to the, the state court court of appeal system. But um, yeah, if you are early on your notice of appeal, that might be correctable, but if you are late, you're out of luck. There's really nothing you can do to cure it, but there are some varying deadlines. So it is crucial that you read and reread the court rules and make sure that um, that you're applying the, the correct um, time frame. Certain certain common ones that uh, I've seen people kind of be unsure about is the effect, for instance, of a motion to reconsider. Um, some people try to resurrect an appealable order by uh, that they've maybe missed the appeal deadline by filing a motion for reconsideration. That does not resurrect the deadline, unfortunately. Um, and oftentimes, if there's multiple deadlines, um, it's always going to be the earliest of the options. So um, again, it's really going to depend on the specific order or judgment that you're appealing uh, and what that triggers. Um, there are some procedures that will extend the time to file the notice of appeal, for instance, if there's post-trial briefing that will often extend uh, for a bit of time. Um, but um, but again, that's all covered in the California Rules of Court, and it's in Chapter 8, all the appellate rules. Um, okay, so I'm looking at these questions. I find the title Clerk's Transcript to be somewhat confusing. So it's basically just an appendix of docs prepared by the clerk. Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, I, I I agree. The idea of a clerk's transcript is, is somewhat confusing, especially because the reporter's transcript is also ultimately filed by the clerk as well. So um, it, it just simply is, uh, is filed by the clerk instead of the parties themselves. So, okay, moving on to, oops, moving back to briefing. Um, so briefing is pretty straightforward in a typical appeal. Um, the appellant is the one with the burden of persuasion, and so they get the first and the last word. Um, so there's the opening brief that is filed, and then the respondent's brief is the responsive brief, and then the reply brief responds to the respondent's brief. And this really is the case for 99% of appeals. The only real exception is when there's a cross appeal. And in that case, the court will usually um, offer the parties the option of creating a briefing schedule. But uh, in that case, there's an opening brief and then the respondent's brief is going to be a combined respondent's and cross appellant's brief. 
And then the reply brief would be the appellant's reply brief and respondent or cross respondent's brief. And then the final brief would be the cross appellant's reply brief. So there's four briefing, four briefs in that situation. Um, but the briefing is pretty straightforward. As I mentioned, the opening brief gets filed at the same time as the appendix, if one is being filed. Uh, otherwise, it's just filed on its own. And, um, oops, moving on to the, after the briefing is finished, but before anything really else happens, um, the court will notify the parties that the briefing has been completed and will ask the parties if they would like oral argument. And uh, generally, uh, that is really a matter of preference. There's a long standing sort of debate amongst judges and uh, attorneys about the utility of oral argument and whether it really is going to make a difference. Um, some people, find that oral argument is really just impractical in terms of making any real difference because by the time the argument actually occurs, the court has pretty much written a draft opinion and it's difficult to change the minds once. I mean, it's possible, but um, some of the justices I've spoken with have said there's about a 10% of cases where it really makes a difference, but most cases they kind of know where they're going before the argument happens. But there's another line of thought that it's basically malpractice if you waive an argument opportunity. And part of the theory there is that this is your only chance to really get to talk to the people who are deciding your case. Um, whether it's simply just answering questions or clarifying for the court some points that they may be a little bit uh, muddied on, you know, this is your one opportunity. Um, one of the things that's really increased since the COVID pandemic is the use of remote arguments. Some courts are uh, really heading back into the in-person and some have really adopted the remote as sort of the standard, unless you really want to go in person. Um, and it really depends on which court you happen to be in front of. Um, and usually uh, the oral argument is set several months after the final brief, usually between three and six months. But I had one that was recently just sitting around waiting for a year uh, between the end of the briefing and the the uh, or argument. So um, there's sort of the rule of thumb, but in any given case, especially where the court might be having some turnover with um vacancies, you know, there, there's nothing really you can do at that stage to move things along, um, but kind of wait and see. Um, after oral argument, the court has 90 days to render its decision. And once it does, um, then you have a few options. There's um, a, a brief window in which you can request a rehearing which is essentially just asking the court to reconsider its own decision. Sometimes um, maybe they got some facts a little wrong or um, they didn't include everything that you think is necessary. If you want to bring a petition for review for the California Supreme Court, for instance, to review the opinion, um, then you are bound by the facts that are presented in the opinion of the Court of Appeal, unless you file a petition for rehearing. So sometimes it, there's there's strategic reasons to file one, even if you don't really expect the court to change its, its mind. Um, and then after the time has passed or after the court, uh, the, the court denies the petition for rehearing or the California Supreme Court declines to review the case, the Court of Appeal will issue a remitter, which, as I said earlier, just transfers everything back to the trial court. I'm looking okay. to see there's another question about appeals bond. Um, I actually don't know what all the legal requirements are for the appeals bond. Um, there are specific appeal bond companies that are really experts in this. But um, 
but really that comes up when there is a judgment and the judgments for a certain amount of money and uh and there's no stay of execution of the judgment uh the bond is a way to uh basically ensure that if the appeal is um is not successful that the judgment is actually going to be paid um there's there's a, a bunch of rules that govern uh, stays and whether filing the notice of appeal automatically stays the orders below. And the general rule is it doesn't automatically stay. There's a whole bunch of procedures and um, you're going to want to look through the rules. It's in the Code of Civil Procedure around sections um, 916 on. Um, if it's just like a, a judgment for costs, it does, it does stay, um, just for like a, a payment of costs, but, um, but typically, um, there's, there's a bunch of details and exceptions and, um, that could be probably an hour presentation itself. Um, but yeah, I would, I would absolutely get in touch with an appeal bond expert, or if you've got questions about it, um, usually they require that you post security of more than the judgment, basically to both pay for the um, the judgment and any kind of risk or interest. And um, okay, I'm moving on. Oops. Okay. Um, so moving on to briefing strategies. This is not going to be fully comprehensive, but um, should be hopefully a good starting point of ideas to think about and consider when you are briefing. So generally speaking, uh, the appellate opening brief has certain requirements that have to be included. And then there's some that are sort of a little bit more flexible. Um, they're they're a little different sometimes than in federal court. You may have seen um, like a statement of issues. Uh, there's nothing prohibiting that in a court of appeal brief, but it's not a necessary uh, part of the brief. But um, what is necessary is really governed by the California rules of court. So here I've just kind of listed what has to be there as indicated by the rules of court and everything else is sort of optional. And by everything else, it looks like it's just the introduction <laughs> and conclusion. Um, the introduction is, is one that courts are generally split again. It's just like oral argument. You know, some people feel really strongly about including a very brief introduction in, in the beginning of their brief to kind of give the roadmap or theme of the case and let them know what it is they're going to be deciding. And some find it kind of redundant or not helpful, especially when the introduction gets lengthy and, um, and really just assumes that the court already knows what's going on. It can be kind of more distracting than helpful. So, um, if you do include an introduction, I think the rule of thumb is just keep it as brief as you can. I rarely um, have seen effective introductions that exceed two pages. So um, the certificate of interested parties is a requirement. It goes right after the cover page. And that's simply just to let the court know if there's interested entities or persons, for instance, like a, a major um shareholder in a small company or something that might not be apparent from just the names of the parties, this would be a way to alert the court of the interests. Um, and the statement of appealability is similar. It has a similar purpose as the civil case information statement did. It basically just lets the court know, yes, you have an appealable order or judgment, and here's the code provision that says so. And it is proper to bring the appeal at this point. The certificate of word count, similarly, it just certifies that you've paid attention and that your brief comes in within the word limits, which are currently 14,000 words. Um, 
for an opening brief, half that for uh, the reply, and those are doubled when you've got a combined uh, opening and responsive brief. So um, you can memorize the rules, but I, I wouldn't worry about it. Um, I, I use them as a reference regardless anyway, and I've been doing this for a while. So um, choosing what to appeal, what issues you're going to raise, that is, I think, one of the most important aspects because, you know, there's a lot of ways to approach it. But one of the one of the things to consider is just how many issues are you going to raise? Uh, you know, the uh, master of all, no, right, the jack of all trades, master of none or something like that. Um, you know, the, if you raise every single issue of everything that went wrong in uh, the, the lower court, um, there's going to be probably a hefty skepticism as to the merits of any of the of the arguments. Um, you want to be judicious. I mean, you obviously want to protect your client's rights and you don't want to waive issues that may have potential success. But you also want to choose the strongest arguments. And you certainly want to make sure that you consider not just what the error was and how egregious the error was, but also what is the impact of that error on the, on the case. So one of the things that you need to decide is on each issue that you're considering, what is the standard of review? that the Court of Appeal is going to apply when it reviews the issue that they, that you're raising. So, for instance, if you are really upset because the trial judge just wouldn't let in evidence that you really wanted, and, you know, it just really made the case just kind of veer off in the wrong direction, that might have actually impacted the the case but the court of appeal is going to review that with an abuse of discretion standard so it's going to give extreme deference to the trial court's decision um all evidentiary rulings are generally um given great discretion um there's there's other other issues um but those are those are typically the ones, anything where a trial judge can really go either way and just kind of makes a choice um, is going to be a discretionary decision that's going to be given a lot of deference. And the problem with that is just that the court is going to assume that the decision is correct. And um, there's a presumption in all appeals that the judgment or order below is correct. And overcoming that is really going to going to depend on the standard of review. So to show that the trial court really abused its discretion, you really have to show that no other judge would have made that decision. It's just really um, contrary to the law or they there's, you know, language about it being whimsical or, you know, unreasonable, but not unreasonable like it's just unfair but unreasonable like it is not a reasoned decision <laughs> it's not based in anything um other standards of review are less deferential and so selecting issues um with that in mind might lead you to some of the uh instructional errors or other legal interpretation errors, um, for instance, when interpreting contract language, uh, that would be reviewed de novo. So basically, the Court of Appeal is in the same place to really review legal issues as the trial court. Um, they don't have to interpret, you know, issues of credibility or discretion. So, um, so they basically look at everything anew. Uh, another example, other than instructional errors, um, would be, for instance, a summary judgment review. Uh, if the if the court's looking at it anew, uh, you get the same the same standard as the trial judge did in reviewing the the papers for summary judgment. So that can be a really helpful standard in deciding whether you're going to raise certain issues. So if you have an evidentiary issue and you've got a jury instructional issue. Um, 
you're going to have an easier time overcoming the presumption of correctness probably on the on the de novo review. And then there's the substantial evidence review, which is somewhere in the middle, um, but it really looks at whether there is any substantial evidence in the record, whether it's contradicted uh, or not, that would support the judgment or the verdict or order. Um, so it's a very deferential one as well. Uh, and if you are making the argument that there's not sufficient evidence to support a jury's verdict, that is an uphill battle, <laughs> to say the least. It's not unheard of, but it is it is really difficult. But even if you can show error, and that's that's necessary, you also have to show that the error had an actionable impact on your case. So what is the prejudice? Okay, so the court excluded you know, the witness from testifying or excluded some document. Um, you need to be able to show how did that really affect the outcome. And if you're unable to do that, the court of appeal is going to say, okay, yeah, there may have been error, but we don't even need to address that because it wouldn't have made any difference. So that's also another really important consideration when deciding which issues to raise. If it, if it's a, a really strong error, but it really had no difference. Ultimately, it's not going to be a strong appellate argument. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't raise it. Sometimes it's helpful to raise slightly weaker arguments because of the way that it allows you to bring, um, to present the facts, for instance. There's, um, there's different presumptions with different kinds of rulings. So, for instance, if you're arguing that there's instructional error, then the court considers the facts in the light most favorable to the party claiming error, at least as to that issue. And that allows you to also present the facts in a, a much more sympathetic light to your client than, for instance, if you're arguing something that is just a typical uh, de novo and the the regular presumption of correctness and that any you know inferences are going to be resolved in favor of the prevailing party that's the default so really the the instructional argument allows you to kind of re reframe the the presumption a little bit for that one instruction so it's these are considerations they're not rules they're not you know hard and fast rules of you know when this you do this so um in terms of your wording, and also it, it goes into the issue selections, but your credibility with the court is of utmost importance. Your brief needs to be persuasive, but it also needs to be reliable. There is nothing the court hates more than, you know, having having a party state something as, you know, this is what so-and-so said, or this is what happened. And then they look in the record and it's not really what happened. There's a little bit more to the story. I mean, at that point, anything else you say in the brief is just, you know, it, they, it, they won't take it as seriously. So you want to be, you want to be strong in your descriptions. You want to acknowledge also, the adverse facts, the adverse law, if there is a good reason why it shouldn't apply, absolutely tackle it, take it on head first. But just don't ignore it because opposing counsel most definitely won't. And you don't want to look like you're misleading or hiding anything from the court. Um, not only is that sanctionable, it's just it's a bad, bad way of arguing. It just it kills your credibility. Um <clears throat> but uh, again, when it comes to that sort of gray area where you're not you're not misquoting anything, you're not misleading, but you do have some strategy options when you are discussing the record. Paraphrasing or quoting, sometimes a direct quote can be really effective and really helpful, but sometimes paraphrasing softens it a little bit. Um, and these are kind of the the little, tweaking decisions that will help shape the persuasiveness without really distorting um, the, the, you know, your veracity or the way that you 
tell the story. Telling a story is the most important part, I think, of, of really effective brief writing. Uh, you want the court to know your client, to know the issues, and really have reached the result you want them to reach by the end of the introduction, statement of facts at the end, you know, at the least. Um, certainly by the end of your brief, they should they should be completely on your side. But a lot of that really depends how you tell the story. Um, and there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I find um, reading, reading non-legal things <laughs> It's really helpful for kind of reminding you how to get out of the uh, the basic legal writing structure that that you're kind of uh, taught during law school. It's just very um, uh, it, it works, but it also it, it's a little it can be flat. Um, you know, sometimes it's helpful to tell the story chronologically. I'd say that's probably most common, but it's not the only way. And it's not always the most persuasive way. Uh, and sometimes it can be really helpful to play with it. Um, you know, sometimes people will discuss the case by witness. Um, that generally is very choppy, but um, I've seen it effectively used when there's a very sympathetic party on the other side. Um, and the, 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 the goal of that brief is to try to you know, sanitize and and um, make it less less sympathetic, and and then taking a more clinical approach to it, witness by witness, was was a, a strategy that I've seen <laughs> um, opposing counsel use to just kind of uh, take away the storytelling uh, advantage that I think I had in, in that case. So um, sometimes organizing the case around the major event. Um, you know, a terrible accident, you might want to start with that and then go backwards and discuss the impact of, you know, on parties and their, their family or, um, you know, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about a theme, you know, picking a theme and kind of tying it through the whole brief. Um, sometimes people will organize uh, their narrative by legal issue. So, um I've seen this mostly when when the issues being appealed are of different different nature. So one might be an evidentiary issue, one might be a legal um, jury instruction issue or a verdict form, and there really isn't a cohesive story <laughs> amongst that. It might be the the story is the trial itself, but um, but sometimes just the giving all the facts around any given legal issue um, can be more effective. So um, another important consideration when briefing is tone. Uh, as I mentioned with the, the decision to paraphrase or quote, um, you are an advocate and you want your, you want your arguments to be persuasive, but you also, um, you want to be the brief that the court kind of picks up and puts in its opinion. You want to make their job easier to rule in your favor. And so, especially in the legal analysis, uh, it can be helpful to present it not as a judge, but as, as a authority. And, and to use the wording that the court might uh, just kind of literally cut and paste from your briefing into their opinion. And, and by that, I mean, really, don't get into too many uh, adjectives or sparring with opposing counsel or trial count or the trial court's decisions. Uh, really keep it professional. You can advocate by by using the wording of sentences. So if there's uh, trying to think of an example. So you might you might frame something as sort of the normal expectation and and in this situation as the exception because you know it just the, the way you present the facts can be persuasive without really even using adjectives to make it that way. Um, you can really play with the language, but I'd say, um, 
the the best part of the writing is really going to happen during the editing. Uh, just get down your ideas initially, and then you can kind of tweak it, play with it. Um, but the more you read really effective opinions, really effective briefing, the the more ideas you get for your own. And and again, just anything outside of the legal world, reading any sort of novel or even poetry. I mean, just the use of words can become really a very fun, a fun exercise, uh, especially if you're a legal nerd. Um, <laughs> but I do, I do really enjoy doing this. Um, okay, so here's just some questions that I use, and I think I've I've already gone over these, but this is just sort of a, a cheat sheet to hold on to um, when when deciding which issues. I think one that I didn't mention though is the procedural roadblocks. So on appeal, one of the roadblocks you might find is if you see something that you didn't raise in the trial court or you forgot to object or, um, you know, turned out that the jury instruction you asked for ended up being really confusing. As it turns out, you didn't realize that it would be, but uh, the jury's questions and then the verdict shows that it really got confused by something that unfortunately you introduced in the trial court. Um, the court is likely going to say that you forfeited your ability or you invited to error. And either way, basically you are stopped from arguing the error. And and the reason is is sensible. You, they don't want you to strategically put, you know, landmines throughout the case just in case you lose and then you want to appeal and then suddenly you have appellate arguments uh, already created for you. Uh, the court doesn't want you playing games. So really, they want you to obje object where there's error, where the trial judge can course correct. Uh, there are a few exceptions, especially when it's just a fundamental right, for instance, um, you know, if the court just fails to instruct on something like the burden of proof, just something that's just super fundamental to the the, the case and you didn't object, um, there's case law that allows you to get around the forfeiture rule. Um, but that is not something that I would I would bank on. I think it's really important. Um, and I understand that during trial, there's a balance between making your record and uh, objecting and interrupting the flow, angering the judge. Um, that's a bit of a fine line. <laughs> it's easy for appellate lawyers to look and say, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? But, you know, in the moment, I understand there's there's a lot going on, a lot of moving parts and a lot of considerations. Um, if you find that something happened during the day and, and on reflecting that evening, um, you know, you wish you had objected, at least file something uh, with the court, you know, uh, that day, you know, just like a, a, a request to, you know, re reconsider something, uh, whether it was like an evidentiary ruling, or I've seen this in a, um, a really surprise issue, and somebody asked for a mistrial a day or so after the really egregious error, because they didn't really understand how big of an error and how much of an impact it would have. And so um, they briefed that the night after, <laughs> um, basically explaining why why there was the delay, why it didn't become apparent just how egregious. It was a um, failure to produce evidence uh, and turnover a certain discovery that ended up being rather significant. Um, so, don't necessarily just assume that you've blown your opportunity to object. Um, the court of appeal might consider it untimely, but you might you might not have. <laughs> they could also consider the issue. So it really you give them that option. But if you do nothing and you wait, you absolutely are inviting the court to say it's waived. And then I think I mentioned earlier, when when raising your arguments, typically people will start their brief with their strongest arguments. Um, and I would recommend 
unless there's a, a thematic reason or a, a logical um, reason of, you know, it doesn't make sense to legally consider this until you first consider the, the prerequisite issue. Um, you know, it, it makes sense to start with your stronger arguments. Um, if you have really, really weak issues that you include, it might detract from your stronger ones. And especially if you lead with those weaker issues, the court might just say, oh, this is this is the best they've got. I don't even really need to read much more. Um, they should read it all, but you want them to, to really be um, with you from the get-go. All right. So this is some of what I've already discussed as well, but when um, a couple additional things, adding demonstratives is something I don't see as often as I think it could be used. You know, in there's no rule that prohibits you from including physically, you know, photos or um, the evidence that you have in your in your exhibits, assuming it, it was properly admitted at trial, um, to incorporate them in the brief itself. And that can be really helpful sometimes if there's a timeline, even just a demonstrative, like a timeline that would help the court just kind of visualize something. There's no rule that says you can't do that. So um, the, the key is you don't want to misrepresent to the court that something was admitted when it wasn't um, in the trial court, but um, but you can tell the court, you know, adding this timeline for clarification. Um, you are able to attach to the brief, I think it's up to 10 pages, and so sometimes I'll see people include the key exhibit to the brief itself so that the court doesn't really have to go back and forth to the appendix as much. Um, but uh, in in the brief where it's really relevant, I found that it can be really effective. Um, as I mentioned earlier, editing is probably the most important part of good storytelling, good writing. Um, and I find that it really helps when editing, especially if you don't have somebody else who is available to read what you've written, to just simply read it out loud. <laughs> like you're reading it to somebody, um, it really helps you identify quickly <laughs> where things just are awkwardly written. Um, uh, again, as I mentioned, some word choices, using active voice versus passive voice, uh, all that stuff you might've learned in, in high school uh, or before can really be used intentionally. Um, you can break the rules as long as you have a reason to do it and it, it can be very effective. Um, okay, and I see that we're kind of running low on time. So uh, last real substantive topic is, is oral argument. And assuming that you do decide to argue your case, um, preparation is, is key. Uh, you probably haven't looked at your case for a few months at the earliest. Um, once you're preparing for the argument, the briefing concluded months ago. So it's a really helpful starting point to reread your briefs, not just yours, but opposing counsel's as well. And then you're probably gonna have about 15 minutes on average to argue. So you're not gonna repeat everything that you wrote in your brief, most likely. Um, really just select what is the strongest, assuming you get up there and get interrupted real quickly and you can only really make two or three points. What are what what is it that you want the court to be left with? What impression, what is the most important? Um, I find outlining incredibly helpful. Uh, when I was new to this, I, I tried writing out what I was gonna say. I was super nervous and I got up there, you know, it just, it felt very, um, very, well, not all that persuasive, but really it got derailed as soon as they ask a question, then you're off script, you know, that, that, that you lose the flexibility you really need for a good argument. And a good argument is nothing more than a really good conversation, a very persuasive conversation, but it should be interactive, ideally. Um, one of the hardest things 
is when the panel says nothing. You know, you kind of expect that they're going to ask you questions and you get up there and it's just blank. <laughs> um, that's <laughs> That can be almost harder and more intimidating sometimes than, than getting peppered with tough questions because um, you kind of want to make sure they're engaged, first of all. It could be this, that they've already agreed with you or they've already made up their mind one way or another. So it, it feels like um, you're not really getting any feedback and that, that can just be really tough. But that is a, a really important thing to practice, um, which I will get to. But back to the outlining. Um, I think that it's really helpful to not only outline what you want to get across, but also to outline your main rebuttal points. What are What is your opposing counsel likely to argue and what is your response? Because they're going to they're going to try to expose the weaknesses in your case, which you should have already identified yourself because you've already briefed this thing. But having your responses at your fingertip usually written out um, helps during um, their argument. I find it can be pretty fast paced and I don't, as I said earlier, I don't multitask well. So um, if I've already written out some of my rebuttal points, sometimes I'll just literally put a check mark next to the ones that I should remember I should discuss on my uh, return to the podium. And the the order of oral argument follows the order of the briefs. So it's the appellant that gets to start, then the respondent, and then the appellant gets the last word if they've reserved some time for rebuttal. Um, it's really, really helpful to have the key citations at your fingertips. It's uh, critical in your briefing that you support every one of your factual assertions and every one of your legal assertions with authority and with the record site um, to either the, the reporter's transcript of the oral proceedings or the appendix or clerk's transcript. Um, and to have some of the, the, the main ones at your fingertips, if the court says, well, you know, counsel, what's your authority for that? Or what's your, uh, where in the record can I, you know, is that, you know, just having that really quick familiarity, having it at your fingertips, you know, you, know, you can find this in volume two, page 300. Um, that also helps just kind of give you some confidence, I think, going into the argument. Um, definitely assume that the court has read your briefing and, is familiar with the case. Um, you don't need to go up there and kind of tell the story from the beginning. That will um, not be effective. They really just want to get into the the meat of it. Um, you know, they they know where the dispute is. Don't don't pretend it doesn't exist. Um, but but be prepared to really take it on head first. Um, I think that watching oral arguments can be extremely helpful preparation. Um, at this point, all of the courts in California, I believe the Court of Appeals, are all streaming their arguments live. Uh, they don't all have them recorded for public viewing. Um, I know the Ninth Circuit does. They have a YouTube page. You can watch old arguments. But uh, the calendars for all of the courts are on the Court of Appeals website. So you'll be able to... Um, you'll be able to go and see what's coming up, which division or district is arguing when, and tune in for some of the arguments. You'll get a taste of the different panels and the personalities of them and how they ask questions and what kinds of, what kinds of demeanor, you know, are they an engaging group or do they like to Pose really difficult hypotheticals? Are they looking to expand the law? Are they looking to, um, to really just kind of uh, have an engaging discussion? Or are they, you know, are they asking softball questions to, you know, try to convince the other justices? It, it's helpful to kind of get a, a feel for the court that you're going to be arguing in front of. Um, and as I mentioned, I think it's really helpful to do practice arguments um, without interruptions and with interruptions, but especially without. Um, and if you don't have anyone to do a mock argument with who's going to be able to read your briefs and ask you tough questions and give you feedback, then I suggest at least practicing by recording yourself and watch yourself argue. Uh, it can be helpful, not maybe the whole argument, but on some of the key issues 
and as I said before, anticipate some tough questions. Uh, it, make sure to question your assumptions. You know, there's uh, there's always facts that I will assume are just a given, and and uh, never assume never assume they are, um, or at least be prepared to discuss even the basic basic assumptions of being questioned at argument. And I think you'll be prepared for it. And my other piece of advice for practicing your argument is to do practice discussing all the issues out of order. So if you want to raise three points and you kind of outline them in a certain order and you practice them in a certain order, be prepared for the court to, before you even say anything, ask you a question that happens to be on your third point and being able to kind of transition discussing the third point first and then going back to your first or second. Um, you want to really practice the flexibility. And then day of the argument, make sure you have everything you need on you. Uh, have all of your briefs in case the court wants a, you know, tell me where in your brief this uh, argument is or whatever. Um, have that at your fingertips. Have your outline. Have your your key cases or statutes and your key exhibits physically present with you. Um, if you want to bring your record as well, that can always be helpful as well. I see we are at the one hour mark. Um, so the, basically the last few slides are just my gift to you, which <laughs> is mainly just a cheat sheet for where to find stuff. Um, the court of appeal websites actually, um, a really helpful resource and they have a ton of self-help, uh, um, discussions and, and um, advice and resources that are helpful for practiced attorneys as well as newbies. And um, they've got all the rules of court on there. And I think that it's really helpful to constantly be checking yourself against those um, rules, making sure that everything's compliant. Um, as I mentioned, these Key judicial forms, uh, you can get those on the Court of Appeals website as well. Um, I know a lot of the legal programs also have those like, um, you know, Lexis and Westlaw, but uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you want to see some sample briefing, uh, you know, there's uh, four brief repositories in California where they basically store every brief that has been filed in California Courts of Appeal and the California Supreme Court from certain dates. And they're all a little different, but um, but if you want to see, if you find a, a really a key case and you want to see the briefing on it and you don't have access through your legal research program, you can contact one of the repository libraries, including Alameda County Law Library, and ask uh, the reference librarians for uh, copies of the briefing in these cases. That can be really helpful uh, to see how how the cases that are governing your case may have actually evolved. Um, also, legislative history. I know there's a lot of resources that are are paid resources that discuss the, um, the bills and how. Um, how, which parties, you know, the, all the commentary and the meanings and uh, all, a lot of that is is public record and um, and is free public record. So if you have time and and want to do some of the searching yourself, um, you can get it. Uh, then there's also some free legal research sites I included that are also just um, helpful if you have to find a case that's outside of your legal research plan, um, or if you just need it. Um, and then this is just uh, something that I think can be helpful just to make sure that procedurally you have everything you need in your brief uh, procedurally. Obviously, there's going to be a whole bunch of of, of things that, you know, a checklist here isn't going to be able to cover. <laughs> but for instance, you know, did you include your table of contents, table of authorities, um, your statement of appealability? This is just another check so that you don't just file the brief and get it rejected. Um, but as I said earlier, pretty much everything is correctable. If you file something that's non-compliant, generally you've got a default notice that gives you a certain amount of time to correct it. So, 
um, easier to not have to deal with that, but um, but uh, hopefully that will be helpful. And um, uh, if there's other questions now, I'm happy to take them. If you think of anything later, please feel free to hold on to my contact information. I'm always happy to answer questions or discuss cases. And, um, you know, it's, it's a real pleasure. Um, I see that there is a question. The court has a short staff problem and the court has stated, if your case hasn't been heard within 15 months, can the judge dismiss your case? Um, that is something I have not heard. Um, I mean, the staffing problem, yes, I'm familiar with, but can the judge dismiss your case? I would find that very unlikely. Um, if you haven't done your part, then yes, they could. So for instance, if if they're waiting on something from you, if you haven't, I'll give you an example. The, um, the appellant has the duty to procure the record. So Sometimes it takes a long time to get your um, reporter's transcript. And the court needs to see that you have been diligent in trying to secure it. So, for instance, the court clerk has a deadline to submit it by. And the, the, they're supposed to follow up with the reporters if they don't comply. But um, if you haven't heard anything and it's just been months and the deadline's passed take action, um, you know, write a letter to the clerk, to the court saying, hey, I'm, I'm, you know, representing the appellant or I am the appellant and, you know, I need this to be able to move forward. I've reached out to the clerk, you know, this is past the deadline. What can I do to, you know, expedite things or, you know, basically so that down the road, if they're looking to dismiss your appeal because you haven't been active on it and you haven't been doing your job of trying to procure the record, even though certain parts of it are out of your out of your control, um, that's a way to show due diligence, essentially. Um, and but I would think that if you have done everything that you need, that that um, it, it would be a violation of your if your constitutional rights, if they just simply dismissed your appeal, assuming there's nothing really defective about the notice of appeal. Um, but um, no, I don't, I don't know specifically. Uh, I haven't heard that at least. Um, if there's no other questions, I'll go ahead and wrap for today, but uh, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, thank you to the Alameda County Law Library for having me come and speak on this.